Emerging Scientists tuning in for our third uh, session of the 2020 Yale Chemistry Bootcamp. This three-part series is a product of our department's Diversity and Climate Committee and is designed to give you a sense of what a career in chemistry might look like and how to get there. My name is Elizabeth Stone, or Lizzie for short, and I'm a fifth year graduate student in Professor Scott Miller's lab where I study organic chemistry here at Yale. Through our boot camp series, we've touched upon what you can do with a PhD in chemistry in session one and how to get involved in research during session two. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting uh, our third and final session on how to apply to a graduate program. Although this webinar will be geared towards the graduate chemistry program at Yale, um, the information we provide is applicable to chemistry programs at other institutions and even other graduate programs in general. As a note, uh, recordings of all three of our sessions will be made available to you shortly. During this session, we will give you advice about when to start your application. Generally speaking, applications are due in early December for admission in the following fall semester. This means if you're thinking of applying to a graduate school this year, there's still time. Everyone's experience through the application process will be different. Today, you will hear about this process from the perspective of a current graduate student and a member of the admissions committee for the chemistry program at Yale. Throughout this session, we will describe what materials are required to apply to a graduate program and some strategies to consider when navigating this process. Once you are admitted to a graduate school, you can then decide where to go. Under normal circumstances, you would be able to visit these schools for a couple of days to help, uh, help you select the right school for you. During today's session, we will discuss what factors to consider when making this decision. And lastly, you will hear, as I mentioned, from a current graduate student who can reflect on the admissions process and give advice on perhaps what to do differently, um, as well as hear from a member of the admissions committee. After you hear from our two speakers, there will be approximately 30 minutes for us to answer any questions you have about how to apply to graduate school. We encourage you to use the Q&A function to ask questions throughout the webinar. You can also upvote other questions that you would like answered. Our moderators, Noreen and Professor Ziad Ghanem, will be facilitating the Q&A portion of our session today. So we will first begin uh, from hearing, hearing from Josie Jacob Dolan, who's a third year graduate student studying artificial photosynthesis in Gary Bredvig's lab. She did her undergraduate studies at Fordham University in New York, where she majored in chemistry and minored in theology. During this session, Josie will talk to you about her graduate school application process, as well as some general tips and tricks. Take it away, Josie. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Josie. Thank you, Lizzie, for the, for the introduction. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about my grad school application process. But I want to reiterate uh, what Lizzie said in her introduction and make it really, really clear that there's no correct or right way to go about this. Um, the process should be and will be really unique um, to each person. Um, and so I'm not trying to like offer a roadmap here or anything. Um, I just want to give like one example of the route that I took. Um, and I also hope that kind of I'll be able to share some some helpful um, points as we go along that might help you help you in your own process. Okay, so, sorry. Um, I guess I'll just uh, tell you a little bit more about me. Um, as Lizzie said, um, I did my undergraduate at Fordham University, um, and this is a liberal arts college, and there's no uh, graduate program in chemistry there. So the department is very small for chemistry, about like 10 majors per year or something. Um, and yeah, no graduate program. So there wasn't really, I didn't have a good image in my mind of what a graduate degree in chemistry really looked like. Um, there weren't any grad students around in lab for me to kind of bounce ideas off of or hear about their experiences. But kind of on the other side of things, um, since there were no grad students, I also kind of got the opportunity to have um, a pretty leading role, I guess, in my research um, as, as 
all undergrads. Um, and I also had the opportunity to TA for some classes and got some teaching experience, which is, I think, um, really helpful. So I started my, um, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with advancing. Um, I started my research um, in my sophomore year uh, at, at Fordham. And um, the way I approached this was just, I had a professor um, teaching my discussion session during my freshman year gen chem class. I approached him at the end of the year and asked if I could join his lab. He gave me some reading to do over the summer and I started um, in the fall of my sophomore year. Um, I stayed in his lab for, for uh, my sophomore and junior year and the summer in between, um, I had the opportunity to do an internship at a pharmaceutical company um, in Cambridge. And uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and so at this point in, in my career, I was thinking that this is what I'm gonna do. I wanna work on drug design. Um, and I was kind of toying with the idea of maybe doing a PhD and then um, continuing on um, my uh, into industry. Um, but then um, going into my senior year um, of uh, research at um, Fordham, I switched labs. Um, so that summer I joined um, a materials chemistry lab and I was working to make nanomaterials for um, energy applications, um, solar applications, and I, I loved it. Um, I thought this was the greatest thing. And so my plans just kind of changed. And I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do energy sciences uh, research. Um, but for me, um, I also like thinking about just my needs and my specific goals. Um, I decided um, that I didn't really want to go straight from undergrad to grad school. Um, it was really important for me um, to spend a year specifically focused on social justice um, and service to others. And I felt that the time between undergrad and grad school was a good time in my life um, to, to be able to do that. So I had decided I wanted to go to grad school, but I also um, decided I wanted to spend a year doing service. Um, so I talked to my chemistry professors. Uh, they were a little bit hesitant. They didn't love the idea um, of me of me not applying to grad school right away, um, but I made it clear this was important to me. Um, I ended up applying to the Jesuit Volunteer Corps and um, I was placed on a reservation in Montana where I lived with a couple other volunteers who were fantastic. Uh, I taught PE in elementary school, um, which was super fun, very different obviously than chemistry, but I also got to do a little bit of science enrichment teaching on the side. Um, and uh, while I was there, um, I applied to graduate school. So I think my first little takeaway that I want you guys to, to hear is that graduate school is not a door that closes um, right after you graduate from undergrad. Um, I know plenty of people who go work in industry for a couple of years um, and then decide that they do want to do this and then they, they apply then. Um, so there are some people who apply and then realize they're not quite ready um, and you can request to defer your admission um, for a year. Um, and so really the option to go uh, to graduate school will exist when you're ready. Um, and so if you're ready to go directly from undergrad to grad school, fantastic. Um, if you're not, it's okay to think about that. On a little bit more of a practical note though, um, I did take the GRE while I was still in school. I think that sometimes it's a little bit easier while you're kind of like in the test taking mode um, to get those standardized tests out of the way if you do um, choose to take those. Um, yeah, but I did do the rest of my uh, application while uh, my, I was doing my gap year. So, okay, I'm gonna dive a little bit more uh, in depth into the actual application process and um, some questions that, that might come up. So the first big question might be um, how many schools to apply to. So I've asked around a little bit to try to get get a sense, and it seems that five to 10 schools seems to be the normal range. Um, I applied to 10 schools. Um, I applied to eight chemistry programs and two chemical engineering programs because um, I was interested in the research of those as well. Um, uh, and it's a good idea when you're, when you're making your list to have, have a range of schools, um, some safeties that you, you are more confident that you'll get into, some, some fit schools and as well as some reaches. Um, it's also a potential option to consider 
um, doing a, a post back year um, to have more research experience before going to grad school um, or apply to industry um, again to have to keep working um, and see kind of what you like um, and get more experience. So I want to talk a little bit about about the barriers. So one big barrier um, to applying to many schools or really any school is is the application fees. So these can be like up to like a hundred dollars each. And so that's that's huge. Um, and for me, I was really fortunate because since I applied while I was doing Jesuit Volunteer Corps, which is an AmeriCorps program, I I had most of my fees waived kind of automatically. Um, however, if this is is a concern to you and a barrier, uh, most schools will consider giving you a fee waiver. Um, it's just important uh, to look at each school individually at what they're what they uh, ask as like the qualifications, and also remember that the application for the fee waiver is going to be due before the application. So check the dates um, on that, so that is not something that you miss. Okay. Um, so then the next thing that I wanted to say was how to pick schools. So you want to think a little bit um, about location, like geographically, where do you want to be? Uh, what research is happening at the school? It's good to pick a school where there's a couple different groups you'd be interested in working in. Uh, look at the rankings. So um, I think an important thing to think about with graduate programs is that the, the ranking of the program that you're applying to is not, um, necessarily going to correlate with like the prestige of the university necessarily. Um, so these are these are good things to look up. The size of the program might be important to you. Are you looking at a really big research school, a smaller department? Um, and then also maybe the teaching and course requirements uh, might be uh, something that varies from, a lot from school to school. So for me personally, location was really important. Um, my boyfriend was working a job in Connecticut. Uh, I wanted to be close by, so I limited my search to only apply to schools between Philly and Boston. Um, I think, I mean, for me, so location was really big, but even um, if that's not your situation, it might be important to think about where you're going to school is not just the school, but also the place that you're going to be living for the upcoming five or six or maybe more years of your life and some place that you would be happy being. Um, so maybe for some people that means being close to friends and family, maybe for some place, some people it means being someplace warm um, or by the ocean or by mountains or things like that. And I personally think those are completely valid reasons um, when you choose to apply someplace to think about. Okay, so once you have picked your schools, um, you uh, are gonna, have to work on the actual application. And my first really big tip is make a spreadsheet. Um, so I made a, just an Excel sheet that had the list of all the schools I was applying to, um, along with their uh, due dates and then like the requirements, like how long is the essay, um, do they want the GRE, things like that. And I found that super helpful for keeping organized. Point number two, um, ask for help with your application. Um, so this specifically applies applies uh, to the um, personal essay and I would recommend asking a lot of people to read this for you and um, additionally be really open to suggestions that they might have. So uh, I sent mine to my undergrad research advisor, the first draft I wrote. He was kind of like, mm, you should scrap this and try again. And the second try was so much better. It, it's a kind of strange process to go through and it's probably gonna take a lot of iterations. Also, I would recommend having some people read it who are in your field and are understanding what you're writing about the science. That's certainly helpful, but I think it also might be helpful to have some people from outside um, who are looking more at how you're portraying yourself and what story you're telling. Um, okay, and so in that, case that you're making for yourself sometimes, I think this can be a little bit awkward. Uh, we're not really used to, to bragging, um, but you, you shouldn't be humble in this. This is the point. The point is to make a case for yourself, to show what you will contribute to the department. And I would highly recommend using as specific of examples as you can um, to demonstrate why you'll be a good researcher, but also why you'll be a good lab mate. Um, 
why you'll be a good mentor or a teacher. Um, all, the, all the different parts that go into being a graduate student, you should make a case for. And then you really need to tailor each application specifically to the school you're applying to. So there are some parts that can be the same from application to application, like uh, your description of your personal research probably won't, won't change so much. Um, but you want to make it clear that you have done research on the program that you're applying to. Um, and so this means uh, talking about specific uh, labs that you think are cool and you are interested in, and then maybe also some other, other things that are going on at the university or the department um, that you might be interested in. Okay, this is my last slide. Thanks for hanging with me. So this final slide is about choosing a school once you have been, um, once you've been accepted. And a big part of this, kind of Lizzie um, already alluded to this, is, is the visiting days. Um, so uh, this, this will be when you come to campus. I don't know if it's gonna be different this year, probably. Um, and it's important to know that uh, your expenses for this trip would be paid for, your flights, your accommodations, and food. Um, so that shouldn't be a barrier. Um, and then it's really important to know that you are the one interviewing the school during these visiting days. Um, you're already accepted. They, the school knows they like you. Um, you're there to find out if the school is a good fit um, from, your, from your point of view. Um, and the best way to do that is really just ask a lot of questions. So I tried to put together a couple ideas of questions, but this is certainly not an uh, entire list, but maybe asking questions about the depo department culture, excuse me, um, so maybe this would look like, do you guys have social hours? Um, do people in the department hang out with each other outside of just their lab work? What does that look like to your department? Um, maybe you're interested in what people uh, go to do after they graduate. Do they go on to be postdocs? Do they go into industry? Do they become lawyers or consultants? Um, so some, maybe one of these is specific to you or you're interested in, in there being a variety. Um, I think visiting days is a good opportunity to kind of get a better sense for which labs are interested in taking new students. Um, sometimes I think this is a little bit hard to tell just from, from groups websites as you're doing your research ahead of time. Um, and then I think a big one is this question of what else are students involved in? Or some people like to phrase it as, what are, what are your hobbies? Um, and really what this question I think is trying to get at mostly is kind of, do you do things outside of lab? How much time do you really have? Um, and for some people, uh, this question is gonna be really important. Um, and for some people, maybe that's, that doesn't matter to you so much. Um, but I think, I think that's a good question to ask. So uh, that's, that's what I have for you guys. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to hand the controls back over to Lizzie, um, and I will be around at the end for the Q&A if there's any questions you think I can help you with. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Josie. Um, so next, I would like to welcome Professor John Elman, who is the current Director of Graduate Studies here at Yale. Professor Elman got his PhD in organic chemistry from Harvard University in 1989 and then traveled across the country to conduct postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley. He stayed at Berkeley as a chemistry professor until 2010 when he moved to Yale. As the director of graduate studies, Professor Elman will be using the Yale chemistry graduate program as a case study for describing how to apply to a graduate program. Take it away, John. Okay, thank you very much, Lizzie, um, for the introduction and also Josie for describing uh, your process and what you thought about in terms of going to graduate school, how to select it, how to organize your thoughts, how to put the best application forward. I think um, what, what the people who are viewing this webinar will note is that I'm going to actually reinforce a lot of the really good suggestions that Josie made. So I'm going to start actually with links. Um, there we go. The uh, uh, 
the, the mouse is a little slow. So useful links to take a look at. I'm gonna start by the link uh, which provides the chemistry department information with what you need to put together for our graduate application. What you'll find is it's really quite similar to most other chemistry graduate applications. I can speak directly to Berkeley, but also more indirectly to other institutions where I, I know faculty uh, members quite well. Now, this will provide not only what parts that you need to include, but a brief introductions regarding what types of information you'll like to include on those different aspects, like your um, statement of purpose or personal statement. I'll cover this as well, but this is a very useful resource for these different items. I do wanna emphasize that our application is due December 1st. Um, many other schools also have uh, deadlines at December 1, uh, some have December 15th, but it's a, a good target date to look at, not only for your application, but also any test scores you might want to submit, or transcripts and letters of recommendation. And I'll talk about these items as we move through the different parts of the application. Now, on this particular link, um, what you're going to find is that it provides access to um, provides access to, and I'm having, there we go, provides access to the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences application and instructions link. This is also very useful because at this link, you'll actually access that online application and submit your materials. Um, with this GSAS link, you'll also gain information about how to submit, let's say the transcript, the letters of recommendation, and the test scores. There are particular codes that you wanna to provide to institutions to facilitate that transfer of information. Another item that's really important about this Graduate School of Arts and Sciences link is that it is where you're gonna take a look at fees and potential fee waivers. Josie talked about this in a little bit of detail and I wanna discuss specifically the fee and waiver process at Yale. The fee this year is $105. Um, when you think about the number of potential schools you might apply to, that can certainly add up. And this year in particular, um, with the pandemic, we also understand it's very difficult um, for many students right now. There are financial hardships. So as Josie mentioned, there are two types of ways that fee waivers are granted. One is if you're part of a particular special program, as was Josie, an event, a fellowship, or certain status. And at the link shown here, uh, the Graduate School Arts and Sciences link, you'll be able to see a list of all the particular types of special program, events, fellowship status, and so on. So you'll be able to gain that information. Now, if you do not fall into any of those categories, you can still obtain a fee waiver if you provide documented financial hardship, and that may be true for many of you. And this is whether you're a U.S. citizen or international citizen, okay? Now, our deadline, Josie mentioned, the deadline can be sooner than the application deadline. At Yale, the deadline's November 30th, which is only, what, a day or so sooner than our application deadline. But I'd encourage you to submit it much earlier than that because the fee waiver request must be approved before you can submit your application. So if you do intend to apply to Yale and you would like a fee waiver, I would encourage you to try to get that in by November 1st, if you can, uh, so that there is time for the university to evaluate it and make a decision on whether they'll grant that fee waiver, okay? So that turns out to be quite useful to you. 
um, if, if you're interested in getting that waiver. I should mention this is also purely decided upon by the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So the chemistry faculty members uh, do not have involvement on whether or not to grant a request. The third item that I've listed relates to Josie's comment that you might want to look at what the requirements are of a graduate program. How many classes? Uh, what are the teaching requirements? We have five classes. We have a requirement that each student teaches twice. Um, we have a, a qualifying exam. They're similar to many other chemistry graduate programs, but it's very concisely listed at this particular link. Now, if I go to um, the next slide, what I want to really go through now is the application process. It turns out that there are three or more faculty members in your area, uh, and you pre-select your area, that evaluate your application. So in thinking about how you put together your application, it's good to think about it in the context of who's going to evaluate your application. It's actually the faculty members in your area of indicated interest. And I should mention here that these uh, uh, faculty members may have different uh, aspects that they emphasize more or less. So there's a little bit of variability from uh, division to division. Uh, and this seems to be a general process that's used throughout uh, the country. For example, Berkeley's is similar. Now, the first item is the statement of purpose or personal statement. And here you want to indicate your, your passion, your reason for being interested in the program. Um, I'd say it's also really important in that statement of purpose section to discuss your prior research experience. I know for some of you that's been a bit challenging because of the pandemic and university shutdown, but to the extent it's possible, it's good to discuss your research experience, uh, put that research description in your own words, because in graduate school, you will uh, spend quite a little bit of your effort on actual research. I've found that sometimes um, students really talk about their interest in chemistry, their passion for it, their future goals, and um, given the word limit, sometimes don't discuss the research quite enough such that the committee um, ends up looking in the letters of recommendation to try to learn more. So. Um, good to talk about all, all, all of the aspects, your passion, your future goals and whatnot, but ma make sure you do spend a bit of time at least on your research um, and your goals and progress in that research, what excited you about it. Also, as Josie mentioned, um, in that research statement of purpose, what you're going to want to do is also discuss um, a personalization of your application to the school you're interested in. So as Josie mentioned, if there are faculty member, you can pull these faculty member interests off of the departmental website. If there are faculty member whose research you're particularly interested in, you do want to uh, take a look and maybe very briefly comment on aspects that you find particularly interested. Um, the, faculty committee will tend to look a bit more favorably on an application if the student has shown uh, effort and interest in looking into what the program's about. Now the diversity statement is 300 words or less and in the departmental link there's a really nice and concise description of what should be included. It's in 300 words or less. We ask that you provide a brief description of your own perspectives on diversity, why it is important, how you have contributed to or will contribute to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that's a really nice and concise description. That's really what you want to do with this particular item. The next section is the um, grade point average. And uh, also along with grade point average, uh, also, you want to list or are required to list the grades and the specific science and math courses that you've taken. So the committee will look both at your overall GOPA, but most certainly also on uh, your level of preparation. 
and your performance in those specific courses. And of course, you'll want to include your transcript um, with that. Next, what we have is the GRE scores. And historically, we've required the general GRE test. And then the chemistry or subject score was recommended, but not required. We appreciate it's a very difficult year in terms of test taking. And the faculty voted earlier in the summer to recommend but not require the exams. And so that's our current policy for this particular application cycle. Now, next we have the TOEFL exam. This is in a situation when your native language is not English, but it is a little bit more complicated than that. If your native language is not English, but you happen to go to a college or university where English is the primary language, and you'll receive a degree from that university and will have spent at least three years in residence at that university, then the TOEFL exam requirement is waived. The typical TOEFL exam requirement that the committee will pay some attention to is the SPEAK score. If a student has a SPEAK score of 26 or higher, they're able to teach. If their score is lower than 26, then uh, the student uh, is not able to teach right away and will have to pass an English proficiency exam um, when they arrive at Yale, maybe, maybe take an English uh, speaking course. And so uh, students who have below 26 are accepted, but it is a bit more challenging than if it's 26 or above. Next, we have uh, the letters of recommendation. Here, my one recommendation would be to request those letters of recommendation early. If you request them, let's say a week before the deadline, they may arrive late. We'll still certainly accept them, but the applications are reviewed not long after our deadline. And so it is ideal to get those letters of recommendation in on time. So the people you choose to write your letters, it really is a value to ask them in advance. If you have a research supervisor, that's great. Maybe someone you've taught with uh, and interacted with a lot in that capacity, that would be good. If you have an instructor for advanced class that you did well in and really enjoyed and interacted with, that's also a good choice for the letter. The final item is the resume or curriculum vitae um, and then supplementary items. Josie mentioned that you, know, you, you, do wanna, um, you don't wanna be modest, right? And a resume and a curriculum, these are really nice ways to list um, activities, awards, uh, research presentations, publications in a concise fashion. And so I encourage you to include that. The committee will generally take a look at that. Supplementary items can include publications. If you're an author on a publication or you've submitted a publication, you can include it in that supplementary item section. But I do want to encourage you, even if you include supplementary items, to still discuss your research in the statement of purpose section. And that's because not every committee member will necessarily look at, at those supplementary items, okay? So definitely still mention it in that statement of purpose. It's a value, but it doesn't replace that statement of purpose. And so with that, I'm, I think done describing the application and the key components, but I would definitely be happy to ask any questions that you might have. And I'm gonna pass this now back to Lizzie. Thank you so much for that, John. Um, so now um, we'd like to open the floor for the live Q&A portion of our session. Uh, so Professor Pat Holland, who's the Director of Graduate Student Climate and Diversity, among other things, uh, will join our two speakers to help answer your questions live. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by reading. Uh, a question. So how many years of research experience are a minimum to be competitive for a prestigious school such as Yale? I'm going to take a, sorry, Pat. Um, no, you go ahead, John. Okay. 
there's not an exact answer to that question. Um, I, I think, and, and, and the view of different faculty who may be on the committee might vary. So that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. My own perspective is I, I really want to see that a student has sufficient research experience that they know whether they're passionate about research because learning about uh, science in a classroom is a different experience than actually doing research in the lab. And um, there's not always a match in terms of enjoyment. So that's really what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for uh, whether someone has sufficient skills already and, and don't need to pick up new skills. I think in graduate school, you pick up skills. But I do want to see that someone has sufficient experience that they know they like it. There's a level of uh, enthusiasm about it. Um, this year, it's going to be different as well. So that's just a, a really big question. It, it's difficult for students this year. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Um, so th that aspect, I also can't really answer. So I'm going to pass it on to Pat now. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really have anything to add on that one. And I was sort of looking ahead at the other questions too, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, uh, we'll skip on to the next question, uh, which would be, if you guys have any tips on how to make the first contact with a professor conducting research you might be interested in. Um, I guess I can, I can try to take that one. Um, I, I think you can just send them an email. I don't think um, maybe the actual professors here have another opinion on if you want to receive those, but I, I think it's okay um, to just say you're interested. And I guess um, if the application still is going to have to go through the university, so it's not like you'll get an acceptance from this professor that you're, you're interested in working with. Um, but I don't think it can hurt to, to say that you're interested um, and maybe ask some questions that you might have. Yeah, Josie, that's a really um, good point. I think that there are some institutions in other countries where you apply specifically to a faculty member and they decide whether or not you're admitted. Um, at Yale and I, I think almost all institutions in, in the US, it's more uh, a, a committee that decides. But mm -hmm. it's absolutely okay to contact faculty to indicate uh, your interest or, or to even ask if you're thinking about whether it will apply if they'll be taking students. Sometimes a faculty member has lost a grant or the groups they realize larger than they really want and they want to downsize a little bit. I think most faculty would be upfront if they don't plan on taking students in the subsequent year. So definitely find the contacts uh, faculty via email. Maybe I'll add just some a, a little bit additional to that. You know, one of the things that can uh, can hurt a personal statement is if you mention a number of faculty that are already retired or something like that, and they're not actually research active. You, you know, that looking knowledgeable is one of the messages that you want to send in your personal statement. And so actually, you know, that's another reason to look into their chemistry and, um, you know, take a close look at their website and contact them if you have, you know, particular interest in projects. Um, but don't feel like you need to do that. It, it, it doesn't really affect the application process, whether you have contacted them or not. So don't feel like you have to do that in order to signal that you're interested you send us an application to show that you're interested. Um, but don't hesitate to contact us to ask about our groups and our research because, you know, we, we love talking about that. And um, another point related to Pat, Pat brought up a really good uh, point. Um, when you do mention uh, a faculty you might be interested in, um, it, it's fine if you're, um, cross-disciplinary, let's say materials and inorganic or inorganic in, in theory. But um, sometimes uh, applicants might list someone who's uh, hardcore materials, chemical biology, theory, and then organic synthesis. And, and, and then it, it, it's kind of confusing about what the student might want to do. If you pick cross-disciplinary faculty where there's some relationship, that, that's fine. 
but if it's really all over the map, that might not help you as much. Yeah, I think those are all really great points. Uh, the next question I think is more geared towards Josie. Uh, during the interview process, did professors question or bring up why you decided to take a gap year? Do you think this affected your admissions in any way? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So for uh, chemistry, uh, typically there isn't really an interview process the same way there is in like the biological fields where you go through an interview before you get accepted. Um, for chemistry, it's just you send it in and, and then you hear back and then you get to go in for visiting days once you're already accepted. Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't really an interview process um, where I could be questioned on that. Um, I feel like it did help me in a couple ways. I think, first of all, the group that I ended up joining just like the summer before my senior year really is like where I did my good undergrad research. Um, so I had my whole senior year to, to work on that project and kind of develop my research um, and then was able to write about that more fully um, when I applied. I also had, you know, more advanced courses on my um, transcript. It does mean I didn't have like a senior slide or whatever, but it was, I think, good. Um, and, and then when I did come to visiting days, I did talk with professors um, about how, how I had, where I was coming from, like why was I visiting from, from a remote part of Montana. Um, and, and I think those were nice conversations and it, it does, um, I, I think also gives them something, something to remind, remember you by and um, a, a nice conversation. So I don't, I don't think it hurt me in any way. I think it was very positive. Do either of the faculty members want to weigh in on if you think taking a gap year affects the admission decision at all? I would say that uh, different students do it differently. Some students apply during their senior year and then defer and take a gap year. And that's perfectly fine. There are always some students that do that. Um, and if you have taken a gap year, I don't think it, I don't, I don't think it's harmful toward your application. I, I would agree with Pat. The, we have another question that says, as an international student in Africa, how do, how do my chances, sorry, how are my chances affected by the coronavirus and how does the admission committee account for differences in GPA standard and student research experience as an international student? This is one that I started trying to type an answer and then I realized that it was too long to do that way and then I gave up. <laughs> um, the first thing, the coronavirus, I, I mean, it's, a, it's not affecting the way that we do admissions. Um, you know, obviously, we're going to have to take into account the fact that people's opportunities were hindered by the virus. And, you know, we're, we're normal people. We, <laughs> like everyone else, we were, we were affected by this. And so we know that it, it affects you. And if, if it did, then say so. And, and that's fine, you know. Um, and uh, what was the other part of it again now? Um, was, um, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead if, if you have. No, go, go ahead, I, for, I forgot. Um, how this might affect uh, international students with differences in GPA standards and oh. student research experiences. Yeah, so there are a couple different ways of thinking about that. One is that uh, often the transcripts come with some explanation as part of them, so we often see that. And the other way that we find out how to put students' records into context when they're from an unfamiliar place is in the recommendation letters. Uh, often the recommenders will say something about the university and how they, you know, how you did relative to other people and they try to put it into context. So something that you could do is when you ask people to write recommendation letters, you could ask them to put a little extra effort into uh, putting it into context in a way that we're going to be able to understand. That's a good point. Um, so another COVID-related question. Um, 
So due to COVID this year, there's less money for universities and students are, more students are perhaps deferring. So do you think this, um, there will be less PhDs accepted for fall 2022? Sorry, 2020. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Um, <clears throat> the graduate school, uh, the dean of the graduate school was very clear about this. The thinking was that no, this should not uh, affect the number of applicants admitted at all. And the reason for that is that uh, we actually didn't have that many students defer. We actually only had four students defer. But one way to look at it is that if students defer, well, money was not spent uh, during the year that they deferred. And so um, it shouldn't impact, uh, I think, most institutions for the same reason. Um, with chemistry, because we only had four students defer, I, I don't think it impacts us any way at all. I'll, I'll note with that, that that that's true at Yale. That might not be true at all institutions. I've talked with some colleagues at other places that has uh, had there, there have been influences on the number of people that they're allowed to admit. Um, so I think I think it's going to vary by institution, and it's probably pretty difficult for you to find out as an applicant um, how it's affected, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, how much value is ascribed to publications during the selection process? I can't say exactly, but I can say I did not have any. Um, and I was accepted. Um, I can also say I did have a couple, like I presented at like undergraduate research fairs at my school and the ACS had like a undergrad fair, which I gave a talk at. So I think probably having having some experience talking about your research, I would assume is a, is a, is a good sign, um, but I did not have any publications coming in. I can second that point and say that I also did not have any applications, or sorry, I <laughs> have any publications. In, in maybe, my... I will, maybe I'll answer in terms of a more general point, is that when, you know, if, if you put yourself in our shoes, when we're looking at an application, um, you know, someone, someone in their personal statement, they can say a lot of things about how interested they are and about their experience and recommenders can say a lot of things. But the more that you and recommenders can put in concrete evidence of achievement and of um, you know, ability to do research and to do the things that a graduate student has to do, the more convincing it will be. And so that doesn't have to be publications. But again, I mean, this is true of everything. This is true of our grant proposals that we send in. This is true of anything that you want to convince someone of in life. The more concrete evidence that you can provide, the better. And publications are, you know, a reasonably clear way of doing that. But like like Josie and Lizzie said, um, you know, it's it, it, it we're not just counting publications when we're doing admissions decisions. The same way that we're not just deciding some cutoff of GPA or of GRE score. You know, believe it or not, you know, we're <laughs> we are scientists. We know how to look at multiple factors, and we apply those skills to admissions decisions as well. So, um, yeah, if that helps. The, the one other item I would bring up there is that um, what I've noticed over the years being on different uh, admissions committees with different faculty is, is different faculty weigh things differently. I think some faculty do, do value publications quite a lot. Um, over the years, personally, I really am looking for uh, details, as Pat said, in that personal statement in the letters of recommendation. Um, you can be a co-author on a publication where maybe you contributed only a little, uh, or you may have contributed a lot. And so um, the details are really, really valuable, but um, it, it does depend. Um, I, I do wanna emphasize different faculty weigh things differently. So uh, um, it's, I guess people are people have different 
things they well, emphasize. And this, and, and this is why we have a committee doing it as well. And, you know, this is part of the power of diversity, right? We don't have just one person, uh, one faculty member deciding based on their own criteria. We have several people so that, you know, they, they have to agree on it. And that's, I think that's as it should be. So we have another question about um, just kind of reiterating what should be included in the diversity statement and Pat, perhaps as you've now joined us and you're the uh, director of the Diversity and Climate Committee, you can share a little bit more on, on what the committee is looking for in the diversity statement. Sure. I think the diversity statement, there's no particular requirement of what we're looking for. Um, I think that it has a few different roles. One of them is that if you feel that you would add diversity to the community, that's something that we value. There's lots of evidence that uh, the scientific process is enhanced by diversity. And so that's something that you could bring out. Um, but it also sort of uh, doubles as a place to mention your thoughts on diversity and uh, and, and, and sort of what your, what your values are. And that is something, you know, that something that is useful for us to see that you would work well in our environment and we have an interest in having a good climate here. So I think that those are kind of, you, you know, the, the, those are the, the sorts of things that are useful. Um, but, uh, you know, and I, I want to, at the same time, discourage people from, uh, you know, going on some, uh, turning it into a college application essay, right? There's sort of a style of college application essays that's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, flowery, <laughs> that, that might not be uh, ideal for someone applying for a science PhD. So this next question I, I really like. Um, it is asking how interdisciplinary the research is in the Yale Chemistry Department. I'll talk about that one. Um, so I'm part of the Energy Sciences Institute. Um, so I actually am on, on West Campus. Um, Yale has like two, two campuses and I'm kind of separated from the rest of the people on the screen right now. But um, so we, I would say we're pretty interdisciplinary. Um, in my lab alone, Gary's lab, uh, he has people who are working on like growing spinach and looking at um, photosystems. Um, I'm, my research is a little bit more materials based. Um, and then other people in the lab uh, do synthesis of photosensitizers. Um, we're also joined by people who are laser spectroscopists. And we all meet multiple times a week um, to kind of discuss our different approaches um, to the same projects that we're working on. So I guess that's a pretty specific example, but I think that kind of happens throughout the department in different ways. Someone else wants to talk more to that point. I can um, also jump in. So uh, I, as I mentioned early on in this uh, session, I work in Professor Scott Miller's lab and we have a lot of collaborations ongoing both you know, across the country and within the department. So I'm, I've collaborated with um, our, one of our physical chemists and also uh, computational chemists and I think the department overall, the students, um, you know, to kind of answer one of Josie's hypothetical questions, I think we have a very good community uh, feeling to our department and that facilitates a lot of uh, research collaborations and also leads to a good, um, a good environment to work in. So I don't know if the faculty also want to mention um, other collaborations that have been ongoing. I think the solar group is an excellent example, Josie. Yeah, I, I think the solar group is maybe uh, is just a great example, very interdisciplinary. Um, if your interests are more to the biomedical, though, there are a lot of opportunities there. So many faculty have collaborations with scientists at the med school, and it's within walking distance. So that's really nice. 
um, also within the biology department, MBMB, MCDB, um, molecular biology, biophysics, and so on. So those are quite common. And um, I guess within my own lab, we've had collaborations with uh, inorganic chemists, Kimmer, mechanistic studies, and the med school and biology. So I think it is quite a collaborative uh, department uh, by and large. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I can add much. I mean, we, we collaborate with many groups outside of Yale and with groups inside of Yale. And, you know, I've, I, the, because we have, you know, technically it's three buildings, but they're all connected and you can't really even tell when you're entering a different one. Everyone is close to one another, and which <laughs> used to be a good thing. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, it will be again. And, um, and, and there are a lot of interactions between different groups, both socially and scientifically. And, um, you know, I think that's the kind of environment in which collaboration thrives. Our next question, um, when applying, how important is it to have a reference in the field you're going into? For example, if someone started in catalysis and wanted to transition into, more, into a more biological field, would they need a biological reference? I would maybe maybe John can uh, can you know state if he if he thinks differently. I think the best recommendations to have are the people that can speak about you with their own personal experience. Like I said before, having concrete examples of things that you've achieved and of the kind of qualities that you bring to graduate school is most important. So if you know, all other things being equal, sure, it's going to be evaluated most closely by people in the area in which you're applying and having overlap with them is fine. But don't let that outweigh having a recommendation that is going to be personal and positive and have examples of uh, ways in which you would be a great fit for the program. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think um, if, if at all possible, it, it is important to have one of the recommenders be someone who uh, you've carried out research with. That, that is an important person to ask, um, partly because they can comment specifically on research, but they also have interactions with you that are likely beyond what you might have been able to gain in, uh, let's say, a classroom setting. So. Um, I would emphasize that. Um, beyond that, I, I, uh, I'd say if you plan on switching areas, um, there, you know, if there's a good rationale for why you're switching, um, is there a particular experience in that new area that you're really uh, excited about, uh, that you really enjoyed? Um, it tends not to be a good sign to say, well, I didn't like this, so I'm gonna try something different. And I know no one's ever gonna write that, but if it sounds like that, <laughs> it tends to be a bad sign. So this is where I think Josie mentioned, have other people read your application. If they say, it sounds kind of like you're saying, that's not good. <laughs> so that's something to watch out for. So we're, we're almost out of time, but I, I just wanted to ask one final question um, for each of our speakers. If you have any snippet of advice for these students who are about to start their journey through graduate school. Maybe, maybe I'll start us off. Um, so I guess a big thing I was trying to get at in my whole talk um, is kind of, yeah, just that it's unique to you. And I think you should make the process very much you. Um, there's no need to try to fit into a box of what you think an applicant should look like. I think just show the best, the best sides of you. Um, like be be proud of your accomplishments and show them off a little bit. Um, and then I think like this is what my mom always says. You know what's meant to be will be right. So if you don't get in someplace, like maybe it wasn't where you were supposed to be. And I think that it's important to see that the places that you would want to be will see that you're a good fit. So maybe that's a little sappy, but that's what I've got. <laughs> I'll, I'll follow Josie on that and, and try at the same time to answer some questions that were posed by Alexander Sikolov here. 
Um, you know, where, where he, he mentions a number of unique experiences and unique accomplishments. That's great in any kind of application like this because you want to stick in people's minds and the more unique aspects you can bring up, um, the better. And that really shows who you are. So I, th I think I'm, I'm, I'm basically just repeating what Josie said better than I did. Um, but but I, I, I think that's, that, that, that's my advice. And the thing I would come away with was I think the best advice when I was beginning to apply to schools um, it was my, uh, I guess it was an undergraduate faculty advisor and he met a, with a group of us uh, students. And, and uh, he's talking about different schools and we're all getting more and more stressed out. I remember this very well. And then he said, but you know, at the end of the day, don't worry about it so much because there are lots of places where you can get a great education and um, I guess I shouldn't be saying this. I just say Yale's the only place to go. But um, no, honestly, there are a lot of places that um, that can work out for you. Um, so don't don't get overly stressed about it. Um, th there's more than one option, uh, and it's important to keep that in mind. So with that, um, I wanted to thank all of the speakers and hosts and moderators and attendees from all three of these sessions. And um, as a reminder, all of the sessions will be recorded and you can access these later. And we'll also be sending you a follow-up email with additional references and a survey so that we can improve this event uh, in the future. And so thank you for your attention.